Well, I was not expecting this. If you'd have said to me just a couple of weeks ago that I'd be introducing our first ever Welcome Church online, just wouldn't have believed you. But here we are, a lot has changed in the last couple of weeks. Nations have been shut down, the coronavirus is spreading, and our government have put the greatest restrictions on this nation since the Second World War. A lot has changed in a short amount of time. Because of the government recommendations, we're not able to meet together as a church, but I am excited to be able to present to you this morning, Welcome Church Online. And we're gonna have a great time together this morning. We've recorded this ahead of time, so we can put subtitles on it for those that need them. We also are launching this as a watch party. That means you can interact, you can click emojis, you can comment on the side. Why not invite someone to join you to watch Welcome Church online this morning? We uh, are gonna have a great time together. Let me tell you what you've got in store this morning. Shortly, Steve Petch, our lead pastor, is gonna give us a great message of hope in this time of uncertainty. And later on, instead of live worship, as we would normally do on a Sunday, we're going to provide you with uh, links to YouTube and Spotify to some worship playlists for you to enjoy as this online meeting comes to a close. We will also provide you with some links to help you know how you can stay connected or begin to connect with Welcome Church during this time. But for now, I'm really pleased to introduce Steve Petch, who's gonna bring a message that's gonna do you good this morning. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for listening today. Thank you so much for, for watching this video. I'm Steve Petch. I'm the lead pastor here at Welcome Church based in Woking. It's great that you've taken some time out to be with us today. Let me start by saying a happy Mother's Day to all the mums and the grandmas out there. I'm sure this is not the Mother's Day that you were expecting, but I hope you managed to have a lovely day anyway. What a season we are in at the moment. I've never known a time anything like it. Our country and our world is being turned upside down by something that's actually too small to see with the naked eye. A tiny little virus called uh, coronavirus or COVID-19. It may be tiny but the truth is it has absolutely had a huge impact and I guess none of us have experienced this within our lifetime. Now, because of this crisis, our current preaching series has been put on hold. We were talking about living life with contentment, but instead I'm gonna to talk to us about facing this giant challenge, because that's what this is. As I said, the virus may be tiny, but the challenge it's created has affected all of us. Now, let's just reflect for a moment on some of what's actually been happening, some of the, the key things that we've seen. I mean, events all around the world have been cancelled, including sporting events and festivals and holidays and even people's weddings that have been cancelled and postponed. Stock markets have crashed to crazy low levels. Supermarkets have found that the shelves have been completely stripped of goods. Social interaction is now being discouraged between us and we're supposed to be at home and working from home if we possibly can. School children, or most of them, are now at home and uh, that's gonna be interesting for parents up and down the country for sure. Some businesses are facing ruin and I know that people have already lost their jobs in this crisis. Travel's being discouraged. In some places it's shut down altogether. Countries have closed their borders. Perhaps more seriously, hospital operations have been cancelled for some as well to free up resources for the National Health Service. And worst of all, many thousands and thousands of people all around the world have become ill and many thousands have also died, including some in this nation. So can we please today take some time to pray. After this message, why don't you take some time to pray? Pray particularly for those who are still out working and not actually at home because of their job. I'm thinking for a start of the National Health Service workers, but it's much more than them. Let's think of, of teachers who are going in to keep schools open for those that need to be there. Let's think of emergency service workers, of cleaners, care workers, shelf stackers in supermarkets, delivery drivers, till workers, refuse collectors, postmen and postwomen, transport workers. There are so many people who are still keeping this country running and going out and about while this is on. I would encourage us to pray for them today for their safety, their protection and their well-being. And if you know one, why don't you thank them? 
My wife, Jo, is still required to go into work every day as a head teacher, even though with asthma she's on the at-risk list, and I know she's not alone in serving our country in that way. Like many others, we need to be keeping them in our prayers. And let's be praying as well for people who have lost jobs already or who are at risk of doing so. We're hearing about those situations as a church as well. Now, we've been warned that this may get worse before it gets better. Coronavirus isn't going anywhere anytime soon and the disruption to our lives is going to continue for some time ahead perhaps the restrictions may get stronger and perhaps be enforced in different ways as well and of course along the way in all likelihood some of us are going to get ill we could even lose people who we know and love to this virus we now actually do have confirmed cases of coronavirus affecting people who are part of our church family so we need to be praying for them as well and if you want to do that do join in with our online prayer meetings that we'll be doing through zoom and if you need to know more information about that do please ask us now let's get into the bible the truth is challenging times like this have happened all the way through history. This isn't the first plague or the first disaster to affect our nation or our world. These, they've happened lots of times before. A good example that comes to mind is one that was around exactly 100 years ago right now, because from 1918 through to 1920, there was an influenza pandemic that was called the Spanish flu. In fact, over 50 million people died during that influenza pandemic. In fact, it started just as the First World War came to an end, but it killed two and a half times as many people as that conflict did. And that particular pandemic particularly affected people who were in their 20s and 30s. They were the ones who died the most. That makes it different from coronavirus, which seems to mainly be affecting older people, though we should be warned not exclusively. But these situations will happen through time. And although they've happened through history, this is a first for our generation. Of course, the greatest impact that any one of us is going to feel is the impact on our own life personally. Cancellations, disappointments, financial challenges, sickness. Day by day, I know people are living with the fear that someone that we know and love might be struck down by this, or maybe it'll affect ourselves. And then there's the need to put food on the table when supermarket shelves are genuinely empty. And this picture I want to show you right now was taken in Morrison's in Woking on Thursday. So that is just this week. And then, of course, we've also got the worry of what might happen to our job or what might happen to our finance, finances. So many worries. So, as I said, the virus is tiny, but the challenge for us as individuals and as a church and as a town and as a nation and even as a planet is huge. So how can we face the giant and get through these days well? Well, the people of Israel in the Bible had a time when they had to deal with a giant as well. And there's an amazing lesson that we can learn from that moment and that will really help us as we deal with what we're dealing with. So what I want to do is I want to read the story from the Bible. It's a story that many of us have heard of and may be familiar with, the story of David and Goliath. And it's found in the Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I want to read some bits of it. I won't read every word, but I'll read some of it and comment as we go. And then I want us to find this huge lesson that we can learn that's going to help us, each one of us personally, to cope with these challenging times and to face them with grace and with confidence. So I'm going to start at verse one. It says this. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Socho in Judah. Just to help set the scene, by the way, the Philistines were enemies of the nation of Israel at that time. So verse two. Saul, was King Saul, and the Israelites gathered, they assembled and camped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with a valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. Let me just clarify, that's a lot of height. Six cubits and a span apparently adds up to about nine foot nine inches. So this is a giant of a man. I mean, absolute freak of human nature. He is huge. He is terrifying. Verse five. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He wore a coat of scale armour made of bronze that weighed 5,000 shekels. Now, apparently that's about 58 kilos so uh, a really heavy weight there on his legs he wore bronze greaves and he had a bronze javelin on his back and his spear shaft was the size of a weaver's rod which i'm told is big i i don't 
know exactly what that is, but apparently that's big. And its iron point weighed 600 shekels, which is about seven kilos. Just imagine that guy. He is huge. He's nearly 10 feet tall. He's terrifying and he is ready to kill. Verse eight, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not the servants of King Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will all become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man, let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now, this scene is easy enough to imagine. You've got two armies facing each other across a valley. And this giant of a man steps forward and makes the challenge. He's big, he's scary, he's all muscles, he's armed to the teeth, and he's looking forward to slaughtering someone. He's really gonna enjoy this moment. And then he makes this crazy offer. So instead of both armies having a full on war, how about we settle it with a battle just between the two of us? Me versus absolutely any one of you, you choose. Winner takes all. Now that sounds like a reasonable way to avoid a whole lot of bloodshed, except we have to realise it's not a real offer. Goliath is actually taunting them, he's enjoying it. His aim is simply to fill them with fear. That's his whole goal is to make them afraid. Nine foot tall, built like a gorilla, this isn't a fair fight. Goliath is gonna annihilate anyone who steps forward. So the whole army of Israel became too terrified to do anything. And as we read the story, it tells us that this standoff went on for 40 days. And this is just putting terror and actually shame into the whole of Israel's army. Now, to get out of this situation, what Israel needed to find was a champion. And they found one in someone you just would not have expected. It was a young shepherd boy whose name is David, who wasn't even part of the army. And he stepped forward. I'm gonna read from verse 32. David said to King Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Now, now that sounds great, of course, except David was just a teenage boy. And if he lost, they all lost too. If David went down, Israel went down. Goliath would be coming for them next. So Saul replied, you are not able to go out and fight against this Philistine. You're only a young man. He's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This Philistine will just be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now, to me, that creates a question, and it's this. How desperate did Saul really have to be to send a teenage boy out as the representative of the army of Israel, a young lad who's never been trained, never been in the army. He's the one we're gonna send out to fight Goliath. We're gonna put all our hopes into this teenage lad. I mean, David's not a soldier, he's a shepherd, but there was something here that convinced Saul this was worth a try, and you have to wonder why. Well, actually, here are my thoughts, and it's not very pretty. You see, a lot of men in Israel's army were probably waiting for Saul to step up to this fight. Goliath was a giant man, but we're told in the Bible that so was Saul. You see, in the Bible, it tells us that Saul was very tall. It actually says this, that Saul stood head and shoulders above all the rest of the Israelites. He's a tall guy himself. There are two giants in this story. The problem is one of them is an absolute coward. King Saul wasn't quite as tall as Goliath, for sure, but he was the tallest they had. He was a trained soldier. He's the king. He, he's got his armor, he's got his weapons, and yet he sends out a young boy instead. Why does he do that? I think it comes down to one thing, and it's fear. In fact, in the story, as you read it, you find that Saul actually makes David what looks like a lovely offer. He says, would you like to wear my king's armor to go out and fight in? Sounds lovely till you think what's going on. Probably what Saul is thinking is this, if he goes out in my army, in my armor, sorry, people will think, it's me, 
nothing, I've gone out to do the job. David isn't taken in by this. He actually refused the offer saying that your armour doesn't fit me. But it's amazing what lengths fear can drive us to. Let's see what actually happened when the battle took place. This is verse 40. David took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistine looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you're coming at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, I'm going to give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. But David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord says, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and it struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone, the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck the Philistine and killed him. And we discover as we read on that he drew Goliath's sword and cut his head off and took it to King Saul. What a story! What an amazing moment. That is an iconic moment from the Bible. One that's in our common culture, a David and Goliath situation we might talk about. David the shepherd boy kills Goliath the giant with a single stone from a slingshot. David saved the nation. In time, he actually went on to be the king of Israel and is still considered to have been Israel's greatest ever king. He went from being a shepherd of sheep to being the shepherd over God's people. So what can we learn here? How can we apply it to the situation we're in right now? Well, the first thing to say is this. We're not going to destroy coronavirus with a slingshot and a stone. Hey, it's possible in time that someone will come up with uh, some kind of treatment, something is science, a vaccine, antibodies, and we'll be able to deal with it that way. I hope that happens. But the solution for us facing this crisis down is not simply to be braver, not simply to have more faith. We actually do need to take care to avoid this virus. That's not a lack of faith, it's wisdom. I said last week we believe in the power of prayer, we also believe in the power of soap. So let's be washing our hands and following the guidance that we're given. But what then can we learn? Well, the first learning for me from this is this. Facing a big challenge reveals what's actually inside us. Just imagine the scene as Israel actually went to war. I mean, war wasn't new for them. They, they did this all the time. They were soldiers. It was actually a time of year when all the nations went to war in the spring. It's even talked about in the Bible. There would have been bragging. There would have been swagger. There would have been brandishing weapons. I mean, it's just a bunch of squaddies all trained up and ready to go and fight. And when the giant came forward, what was hidden in their hearts was revealed because under all their, their, their swaggering, fear had a hold on them. Any bravado, any bragging they may have done as they walked up to the front line was long gone. Their fear was uncovered. But I want us to consider a question. What has coronavirus revealed about what's in your heart? Just pause and reflect. What's your response been? How have you behaved in response to it? More than that, what have your feelings about this been? Has it been anxiety? What changes might be ahead for me? Has it been stress, just trying to adjust life and hold life together somehow and dealing with these kids at home under my feet for weeks? Has it been disappointment? Maybe something important's been cancelled in your life. I mean, these things are all normal. Perhaps it's been selfishness. The truth is there's been a lot of that on display, as you can see from that supermarket photo I showed earlier. But the biggest thing I've seen the thing that has been most on display and nearest the surface with everybody I've spoken to has been fear. Will I have enough to eat? Will I lose my job? Will I get sick? What might happen to me and the ones I love, and in particular my children? Will someone I love actually die? I actually think the biggest giant that we face here is not 
coronavirus, but fear. That's the big one that's gripping us. Now, part of the reason for fear being so prevalent is that what's happened is undermining lots of things we usually can trust in. Things that we have taken for granted as the basis of our daily lives have been swept away. And it's absolutely rocked our worlds. Maybe those things are not as reliable as we thought they were. No wonder we feel fear. Now, of course, Christians are called to trust in God. The Bible tells us that God is our Father, our Provider and our Protector. Perhaps this kind of event really exposes how much we actually do trust him as our other supports get taken away. Just worth reflecting in each of our lives, what has this revealed to you about your own life and your own faith? You see, if our faith counts at all, it counts in moments like this. To experience fear right now is absolutely not a surprise at all. But if we don't, but if we stay in that place, that's a problem. And we don't have to stay there. I believe we can all overcome fear and Jesus wants to help us do that. His offer of help and strength is available to absolutely all of us. He invites every one of us to put our trust in him. That won't make us immune from the disease. It's not a guarantee that nothing bad could happen to us. Jesus never promises that, but he does promise to walk through all of life's challenges with us, that we can know his, present, his presence as a help in times of trouble. When, uh, when Joe and I had small children, they're all grown up now, but when our children were small, they would sometimes wake up in the night upset. And it would be dark and they might shout or cry from their bedroom. But mum or dad coming into the room would really calm their fear. Just putting on the lamp, sitting with them, fear would be banished very quickly. Right now, a lot of people are terrified. They feel that there's darkness ahead and they, they can't see where they're going and, and people are kind of thrashing around in the dark. In many ways, that's true. But through faith in Jesus, we can know the presence of a heavenly father who brings light into our life and banishes our fears. So how do we deal with this giant called fear right now? You see, the story of David and Goliath reveals an amazing truth to us. But to access that truth, we have to understand the story properly. And there are a couple of ways that this story has often been misunderstood. And, and you know, I've seen it done in churches and preaching as well. So a couple of misunderstandings. The first misunderstanding is this, is that this story points us towards courage. The Israelites were afraid. David was brave. We need to be like David. You should be brave. If we're brave, if we're courageous enough, we can face down the giants in our lives. All we need is enough courage and a belief that God is with us. Come on, be brave. You can do it. You'll probably even find that the giant was not as bad as you thought it was. You might feel small in this situation or that situation, but if you're courageous, you can overcome any problem. Sounds simple. A nice morality lesson for children about being brave. That is not what we're meant to take away from this story at all. There's another misunderstanding I've heard, which is this. This story points us towards faith. The Israelites were afraid because they lacked faith, but David had faith in God. So David triumphed over his fear by faith. We need to have faith in God like David did. We mustn't give in to unbelief in our lives like the Israelites did. If we've got enough faith, anything will be possible. We can see giants come tumbling down. So have more faith. You can do it if you believe and trust God enough. Any of the Israelites could have done it, but only David actually did. So be like David and step out in faith. Again, absolutely not what we're meant to take from this story. But those two misunderstandings are very common. It points towards bravery. It points towards faith. No, no, no. Now, I'm not against courage and I'm not against faith. And perhaps there are other parts of the Bible we could go to to talk about that. They're good things but they're just not the point of this story. To understand this story and find its true meaning, we have to realize something else. This story actually points us towards Jesus. You see, the Bible is really a book about God. It all points to Jesus, all of it does, from beginning to end. And this story, which was a real event that really happened in real history. It's not a myth or a fable, it's a real story. What's, what we've got when we're reading the book of 1 Samuel is a book of history. The author is telling us what actually happened. But to find its true meaning, we have to understand that God used the history of his people to talk to us all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. He's the centre point of human history. God, who's in control of history, designed it like that. Now think about this question, just to help you understand it. In this story, what part do you think that you or I 
might be playing. If this story reveals truth about God to us, where are we in the story? Do you see yourself as needing to be like David? I've got to be brave like that young shepherd boy was, up against a giant. Is that our role? No, it's not our role. In this story, we play a different part. We get to sit in the seat of the scared and terrified Israelites. That's where we belong. We are the ones facing a giant that terrorises us and which we are completely unable to deal with on our own. Israel was faced with a fear they couldn't overcome, a problem they did not have the resources to deal with. And the bottom line is this, Israel needed a saviour and so do we. Our town needs a saviour, our nation and the nations need a saviour and you and I need a saviour too. Goliath, when he stepped forward, demanded something. He demanded that one representative of the people was put forward to stand in the place of them all. He demanded that one person step up and said that the fate of everyone would be decided by what happened to that one individual. His defeat would be the defeat of the whole nation. His victory would be the victory of them all. And as David went forward to that battle, he risked his life on behalf of all of Israel. All their fates were rolled up into what happened to David. What was attributed to him would be attributed to them all. Now David did an amazing job that day. He actually had incredible courage and incredible faith. And that stone flew right to the correct spot and the giant came straight down, probably guided by the hand of God. But that's not meant as a model for how we can defeat the giants in our own lives, as though we can slingshot a stone of faith at our problems and all will be well. It actually shows us that what we need is a saviour. We need someone to come and defeat the giants in our lives on our behalf. And the Bible tells us that that person exists. In fact, the Bible tells us that there was a greater David, who David's whole life pointed to. And that greater David is called Jesus. David was king of Israel. Jesus is king of kings. Jesus was born as a physical descendant of King David. But he was greater than him. He was actually the son of God. Jesus is the eternal saviour. And he's the saviour we really need. We can't battle the giants in our lives on our own. The giant of fear is far too big for you or I to handle on our own. We can try to squash it down, but it just gets back up again and starts trampling around on all our best intentions. To win this battle, we need a champion to win it for us. We need Jesus. And Jesus is so much greater than David. David risked his life to rescue Israel. Jesus gave his life to save and rescue us. The giant David defeated was really just a big man. But the giant Jesus defeated was so much more than that. What Jesus really overcame was the giants of sin and death on our behalf. Every spiritual enemy ever ranged against us was defeated in Jesus. And as he died on that cross, as Jesus was crucified, he paid the price for all our wrongdoing so that everything that stood between us and God was dealt with. And now he offers a relationship with God to us. John 3 verse 16 and 17 says this, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's why Jesus came, our new David, he came to rescue us. Like David with Israel, Jesus stepped forward as our representative to deal with what causes us fear including the greatest fear we have, the fear of death and what lies beyond, which really is often at the root of all our fear. If we put our trust in Jesus, he promises to forgive us. He promises us an eternal life that goes beyond the grave. Once we know we have that, we can't lose because even if we die, we live. In the Bible, it tells us that when we put our trust in Jesus, we are seen by God as being in Christ. That's actually the phrase it uses, in Christ. Jesus, it means, stands as our representative and we are in him in the same way that all of Israel was caught up in, in David as he went forward to fight that day. What Jesus did counts for us. His victory over sin is our victory over sin. His victory over death is our victory over death. You see, Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. He never failed. Yet he gave his life in our place. But Jesus didn't stay dead. By his resurrection, he defeated death. Death no longer has the final word in our lives. 
We have hope. We may suffer all sorts of challenges in these days ahead. We may end up mourning, but we will not mourn like those who have no hope. Because Jesus was raised to life. And if we're in him, if we put our trust in him, we can be raised too. You see, the real message is this, that what Jesus won can be credited to us. And if we believe in him, we get to share in his eternal life. He's the saviour that you and I really need and that our town and our nation really needs. Jesus has opened the way for us to know God as our friend and our father and it really changes everything. You see, when God's your father, in times of fear, you can know him walking into the room of your life in the darkness and switching on his light, which banishes all fear and calming your fears. David was a shepherd who became a king over a nation. But Jesus told, told us he was the good shepherd. He's the king of kings and he wants to be the king over your life and your friend as well. I just wanna read Psalm 23 to finish with. It was written by King David, but really it points us to Jesus. And it's the perfect Psalm for this season in the life of our nation. It says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Don't you need that in this time? He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My friends, this virus is gonna run for some time. It will run and run. It's gonna have a huge impact on all of our lives. It'll make some of us sick. Some people may die. Others of us are gonna face challenges around jobs and employment. There's all sorts of challenges ahead. And Christians are not promised immunity from these things. But I want you to know, as I've said before, that our church and our faith was made for a time like this. We can walk through this season with absolute confidence. Our heavenly father is watching over us and will provide for us. Every moment of our lives is in his hands. Even if we die, we will live. And every one of us can know that. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. There's a great opportunity to do that right now. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to lead us in prayer for a couple of different things. But first of all, I want us to pray for putting our faith in Jesus. Let's just do that together. I think we can all do that whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or you've never really been to church at all, I think every one of us needs to take a step right now in this new crisis of saying, Jesus, I'm gonna put my trust in you. Let's do that together. I'm gonna to lead us in a prayer. Why don't you pray with me? You could just, if you want to, you can just close your eyes and bow your heads. You don't have to do that, but I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna pray. So Lord Jesus, during this time of real challenge in our lives, I pray that you would draw near to us. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would be the shepherd over my life. King Jesus, would you rule over my life? Lord, I wanna put my trust in you. Thank you that you so loved us that you gave your life, that whoever believes in you won't be lost, but will receive eternal life. Lord Jesus, thank you that you didn't come to condemn us, but to save us. Lord, I pray you'd forgive us for all our wrongdoing, our, our selfishness, our fears and insecurities. I pray that you come into our hearts, every one of us, and rule over us. And I pray you'd help us to know your presence, to know the presence of your heavenly Father in our lives, and to walk through this time with peace and contentment. Lord Jesus, draw near to us, I pray. Amen. I also just wanna pray for the situation that we're facing. And I'd encourage you to join me with that as well. I wanna pray that we would be able to overcome fear and I wanna pray for the specific things that are going on. So join me again as I pray right now. And I'm gonna pray for us and I wanna pray for the town and the nation 
as well. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to pray for each one of us that you'd help us to overcome the fear that so naturally comes to us at this time. Help us to walk in a faith and confidence knowing that you're with us. Lord, I pray for our specific needs. I pray that you would protect our jobs. I pray that you would protect our incomes and our livelihoods. Lord, I pray that you would provide every bit of food that we need. I pray we would not run short of what we need to eat. Lord, we pray that you'd be with the people running supermarkets and supply chains, that you'd help them to keep on top of it all. I pray you'd help us each to keep our selfishness in check. Lord, I pray for people who are at home alone right now and are just lonely and haven't actually seen a person to talk to or hug for some days. Lord, I pray that you'd lift their loneliness right now, that they would know that you are with them. Lord, I pray for anybody who is sick right now, including those from our own church community. Lord, I pray for your healing upon our town and upon our church. Lord, would you spare us from this? Let this pass over us. Lord, I pray you would spare us, but I pray for those who are unwell that you would heal their bodies. Lord, I particularly want to pray for protection for those who are out working to keep our community safe and provide our essential services. Lord, for the NHS, for the teachers, for the police and the fire, for the paramedics and the ambulance services. Lord Jesus, for those who are emptying bins and stacking shelves in, stop, in shops and, and, and processing payments at the tills and, and sweeping roads and all the different things that people are doing that are just essential. Lord, so many things, transport workers, Lord, train drivers, bus drivers, Lord, whatever's going on, I pray your protection on them. Lord, I pray that you would keep us safe and stop the spread of this virus in our nation and in the world. Watch over us, Heavenly Father. I pray you would show your power in this time. And Lord, I pray particularly on this Mother's Day for your protection over mothers and grandmothers and upon our children. Lord, would you watch over us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for watching. I hope you found today helpful. We will be online again tomorrow at four o'clock for our encouragement video. We're doing those every day, Monday to Saturday at four o'clock. You can find them on our website, which is allwelcome.uk under daily encouragement videos. We're putting them on our Facebook page as well. We'd love you to look at those. We'd love you to connect with us. You can email us on care at allwelcome.uk. That's care, C-A-R-E. We'd love to hear from you. Tell us how you're doing. How's coronavirus affecting your life? How can we pray for you? I just want you to know during this time that Welcome Church is with you and for you and you're not on your own. Thank you so much for listening. See you online again soon. Thanks so much for that, Steve. What a great encouraging message for us to watch this morning. A couple of quick things to remind you about. Firstly, do connect or keep connecting to us at Welcome Church. We're here for you at this time. Um, if you like and follow the Welcome Church Facebook page, that's a great way to stay in touch or visit the website regularly or welcome.uk. Anything you need, email us care at allwelcome.uk. If you're in a life group, why not get in touch on your WhatsApp now just to connect with them, see how people are doing, share your thoughts on the preach you watched this morning. To let you know what uh, life groups are going to continue as they are all the way through to the summer. So do keep connecting with those. Uh, and if you're not yet in a life group and you'd like to be, just email us. We would love to connect you with one so you can receive some great support. Now, now's the time for you to click on the links in the bio to the uh, worship playlist we've got on Spotify and YouTube. Enjoy these worship songs. They'll do you good this morning. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday morning for Welcome Church Online. Thanks so much. <laughs>